We're excited to be here with you guys today. Um, just to give you an intro while a few more folks join in. Um, I'm Suzanne Miller. Um, I'm a customer success manager with Hypothesis. Uh, I already mentioned I'm joining you from um, just outside Raleigh, North Carolina. And I am joined by my colleague, Christy. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Christy. I, like I said, I'm in Southern New Jersey, kind of outside of Philly. And um, I am happy to be here. I have been using Hypothesis in my own teaching since 2019, um, but I also am a customer success manager here at Hypothesis. Awesome. Uh, we have an agenda here today, a rough agenda. Um, it's going to go pretty quick, uh, but we have plenty of time for questions, uh, and we've got a few folks helping us with the chat, uh, joined by uh, uh, our team. I think almost the entire team is here today um, as panelists. So that's pretty awesome. Um, but uh, I wanted to take a moment to have you guys, I don't know where that came from, have you introduce yourselves in the chat uh, since we've introduced ourselves. So if you can, um, Make sure you pull down uh, in the chat, the blue button, pull down to everyone and uh, share a little bit about uh, your your school, obviously, um, and your role, your department, that sort of stuff. And maybe even your experience level with Hypothesis if it's brand new to you or if you are a seasoned veteran. Okay. And while y'all are introducing yourselves, I'm also going to launch a poll just to see what LMS you're using, because um, this will come in handy a little bit later on in the session. So if you could also take the poll. Sorry, we're asking you to do many things at once. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot for a Friday, huh? Yeah. Negative 30. Ouch. Okay, I think most people have taken the poll, so... Thank you for letting us know so we can take that into account a little bit later on. Absolutely. So I am going to plug on, sort of set some purpose here uh, with our session today. Uh, this actually comes uh, from a blog published in 2019 uh, by uh, several instructors and including our scholar in residence, Remy Kalir. Um, but it had some, we'll call golden nuggets of information uh, about grading and feedback. Uh, obviously it was a study to talk about motivations and engagement with social annotation. But I think the key in this blurb we have here is that participation marks or the fact that annotation was required for a course was by far uh, the biggest motivation for students to annotate uh, using hypothesis. So it's something we cannot uh, underestimate. And, you know, while sometimes it can get, <laughs> it can bog us down a little bit as instructors, um, it's obviously a really important um, part of, of this practice um, that you're using with hypothesis in your LMS. Was there anything that you wanted to add, Christy, about this? I know, speaking from experience, no, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so again, we're gonna, this is not a poll, but this is more um, us sort of prompting you to get some ideas about what kinds of things you want to see from your students uh, in their annotation. So like in a perfect world, uh, what would be some of the things that you would love to see? And feel free, uh, if you don't see it on this list, to go off script. But uh, if you see a combination of things, you can share that as well. But if you can, in our chat, uh, looking at this list, share with us what are those things that you are looking for in your student annotations? Awesome. Thanks, Bridget and Carrie Ann. Awesome. Okay. I'm seeing I'm seeing a trend here for sure. 
uh, on the analysis, the critical thinking reading strategies. Very good. I dare say that might be why you're here today. Because <laughs> uh, we really uh, want to talk about those high quality annotations, um, because that's where the grading and feedback really um, plays a major role. Okay. Insight. Okay, very good. So some of it is about, you know, quantity as far as how many annotations, but it looks like a lot of folks, it's about how your students think through the reading and thinking deeply through that reading. Uh, so hopefully today that sets a little purpose because uh, we can talk about how you can dig in a little further and assess uh, and give feedback on those deeper annotations. So thank you so much for sharing everybody in the chat. The first type of, of grading that we're gonna talk about is analytic grading. Um, this is where we're dealing with learning objectives. They are the obviously the essentials for your course or for that assignment. Uh, <clears throat> professors obviously construct rubrics that represent a, a level of achievement for each of those ob objectives or elements. Um, it does not yield a single holistic grade, but it does reveal its parts. Um, so it really allows you analytic scoring um, to complement if you are asking for analysis for your students, right? So for those of you who shared about analysis being a, you know, a heavy component, um, I think the analytic grading scale uh, could probably be uh, your best bet moving forward. Uh, as far as what an analytic rubric would look like, um, I've actually in this slide shared an example from uh, two instructors at um, the Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, we have credited them here, and you guys actually have uh, the links to the slides, so you can come in here and dig a little bit deeper. But this is, you know, a fairly involved analytic rubric. Um, but as you can see here, we've got each of our objectives, our elements um, that the instructors were looking for, and then we've got a scale that follows from there. So in, in, in the ways that I mentioned earlier, it does reveal each element, each part, and you can really look at strengths and weaknesses. Uh, obviously, some of the advantages of analytic grading is that it brings to consciousness uh, some of those subconscious processes. Uh, that go into recording grades. Uh, so, you know, things we always talk about hypothesis, uh, making learning and reading more visible, uh, an analytic grading uh, rubric can do that. Uh, it looks at those strengths and the weaknesses, and all the criterion are weighted to reflect the relative importance of each element. Um, I don't know if you saw in the last one, but certain elements were worth more than others. Uh, it can be much more objective, which is nice, of course, and it does allow you to give more specific feedback, um, which will lead into our feedback part of the session a little bit later on. And with that said, we're going to talk a little bit, or Christy's going to share with you about holistic grading. Thanks, Suzanne. So um, I think it's really important to keep in mind as we talk about each of these different methods or strategies for grading, what is the actual purpose of your annotation assignments? And a lot of you shared kind of a general purpose with us. Um, the analytic rubric, I think, is really great just as an example for something like if you're having students read academic articles and you really want them to identify like key parts and you're asking them to annotate certain areas, there's really like a breakdown of different things that they're doing. Just one example could obviously be used for other things as well. Um, holistic grading rubrics uh, are a little bit different in that, to state the obvious, they're more holistic. Um, they consist of just a single scale with all of the criteria for the evaluation in one kind of grading area. Um, so the students are kind of just, you, you choose a box that you're going to be assigning the student um, to describe the kind of their whole annotation assignment. So this is one example of a holistic annotation rubric. Um, this might be good for something 
or someone who is using annotations in a more general way in their course, like if maybe you are having students complete different types of readings and you kind of just want to go through their annotations a little bit more quickly um, instead of breaking down like these different pieces that you want to look at. Um, next slide, please. So the holistic grading advantages is that um, we're looking at overall what the learner is able to demonstrate instead of kind of picking out and rating low what they're not able to complete. Um, it also is a little bit faster to complete your grading since you're only looking like you're choosing um, an overall description for how the student has um, scored. And um, it can be applied a bit more consistently if you have trained raters um, doing the grading since there's fewer options. Um, and then that can increase the uh, integrator reliability. And then finally, I want to wrap up with a, another a rubric option known as a single point rubric. Basically, I like to think of this more as like a checklist. So it's kind of like an analytic rubric in that it's listing different criteria of what the students should include in an annotation assignment. Um, but instead of describing what a deficient annotation might look like, it only is describing what proficient for work looks like. So only proficiency is described. It's only describing like you should your your uh, annotation should have X, Y, and Z. You should have three annotations. They and they demonstrate critical thinking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they can be pretty quick to develop since you're only coming up with that description of what a proficient annotation is, but. It's a little bit limited in that the students don't get a good sense of, um, you know, what maybe they have not done well without further comments since that like deficiency description isn't provided. Um, and then we have provided in the slide deck, we saw examples from faculty at different universities for analytic and holistic rubrics. Um, but we also have linked to um, just kind of slightly simpler versions here that you can get started and adapt for use in your own courses. So if you want to check out some other examples of generic um, analytic rubrics, holistic rubrics, and a single point rubrics for social annotation, um, you can find the examples here. Um, and I am going to pass it back to Suzanne now. Yeah, thank you, Christy. So yeah, slide 13 is going to be super handy uh, because like Christy said, these are these are a great starting point, um, especially if you're like dabbling with one or the other. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the art of feedback. Um, and I don't know, uh, I think Christy might, are you going to be hopefully launching a, a poll for us here before I go or should I move on and maybe the poll will be later? Uh, yeah, I can launch that. So um, if you could just let us know. Uh, actually, Suzanne, do you mind going back one slide just so we sure. can all remember yeah. which one looks like which? Which yeah. rubrics do you think you might prefer to use in your course with social annotation? Oh, interesting. Oh, we're pretty split. I know. <laughs> oh, we're actually, unless other, oh, no, no. It's really funny to watch. You got, y'all can't see. <laughs> They're both rolling in, but <laughs> it's like uh, the different rubric types are battling it out. Yeah. Yeah. So far, holistic is sort of edging us out with maybe one additional person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll share those results out while Suzanne continues so y'all can see. Yeah. Thank you guys for sharing that. Um, so now that we get an idea of maybe the type of scoring that you want to do, um, let's talk a little bit about how you can provide that high quality feedback. Because you'll notice that even while we were talking about each type, uh, limitations and advantages, uh, feedback was always a component. And so I really loved uh, this particular quote from Thomas Gus Guskey, um, specifically the idea of 
the fact that students really don't get any kind of direction for improvement. Uh, you know, grade, uh, assigned grade does not equal learning, right? And so only when that learning is paired with uh, individual comments, offering some guidance and direction for improvement, can that learning really happen um, and enhance achievement. So uh, the idea here being that obviously social annotation offers an avenue to provide public feedback, um, but maybe it's not so specific to the quality um, and improvement of the annotations themselves. So with that said, let's just talk a little bit about it. Um, Obviously, social annotations and instructor feedback can model uh, very much like a studio or workshop approach. Um, obviously, it helps students sort of self-regulate, take the initiative they need. Um, and obviously, in that role, uh, the teacher is to provide that guidance and that feedback as a facilitator. But uh, I would say in the margins of your hypothesis assignments, it almost operates like an art studio or gallery where the work is on display um, and it's shared openly for that group feedback. So we don't want to underestimate beyond grades uh, the importance of the reply function in, in the annotation um, or in the sidebar, because obviously that reply, uh, while it is group specific, can really prompt um, you know, contributors to really up their game, so to speak, when it comes to sharing annotations. Um, as far as critical feedback, which we know would probably be a little more private between the instructor and the student, uh, I would say the emphasis should be on quality over quantity. Uh, we want to focus feedback on uh, primary traits or those learning objectives that we talked about earlier. And you really want to use as much language from the rubric as you can. I, I think that accomplishes two things. Obviously, it, it's very specific and, um, you know, constructive for students. But I also think that it, it reinforces using the rubric <laughs> um, and helps students, makes them want to return to it uh, throughout your course or throughout multiple assignments. Um, but I do believe also that it, you want to make more recommendations for how a student can improve rather than identifying those errors or weaknesses. Um, and some people might say, well, uh, perhaps the single point or the holistic rubric would help me in this <laughs> effort to, uh, you know, focus on the positive and focus about how, you know, how they can improve and that sort of thing. Uh, but there are four principles of effective feedback. Obviously, you want to emphasize the task. You don't want to dwell on the student's ability because that can get complicated. Um, you want to give them that specific feedback so they can improve. You want it to be regular and ongoing. Uh, so I would dare say if you're enabling multiple hy hypothesis assignments over the semester, which we hope you are doing, um, that you are staying consistent with the feedback that you might be providing um, through usually through your LMS uh, a grading, uh, feed, you know, grade, grade book function is where you would provide that private feedback um, or maybe on a standalone outside of the LMS. But however you're providing it more privately, you want that to be regular and ongoing. Um, and more so than anything, I think nowadays it's probably most important that you focus on the process, uh, not the results. That's one of the reasons I love Hypothesis is that it's a, a very process, learning process oriented tool, as opposed to that, that end product, um, which you know doesn't provide opportunities for ongoing feedback. We've created a, uh, an acronym here that might come in handy. We call it ART. And uh, what ART stands for is what you see on this slide. Um, the A is to affirm, sharing of course, you know, what's good here in the annotations that you provided. And then again, this is much more in a private uh, back and forth that you might have with the students. So sharing those strengths, reminding them uh, to not forget to, to add this or do this if that was included in um, the assignment. And then of course, uh, kind of giving them a task, like a next step. What is it that you need to do now uh, to move forward and to improve upon this assignment? So with the process of art, uh, we decided uh, that it would be cool to actually take 
some feedback from a couple samples and see what you could do based on what you've learned today. And of course, your wealth of knowledge over time. Um, share with us in the feedback jam uh, that Christy has just posted in the chat. Uh, what you're going to do is you'll notice that there are two examples. Uh, we'll say page one and page two of the jam. And what you're going to do is you're going to pick one example that you like or that you think would challenge you. And you are going to use the sticky note function, which could be fine on the left side uh, of the jam board. Uh, I've circled it on my slide if you can see it. And you click that. And what I'd love for you to do is you're going to see the, the teacher feedback that was provided. It'll be circled. But I want you to try to use two of the art elements um, to provide or improve the feedback um, or improve upon the feedback that was provided from the teacher on these assignments. And with that said, I am going to go back a slide so that you can remember uh, what those elements of art were. I'm just making these a little bigger. <laughs> if you happen to be looking at my screen so you can see it. Awesome. It looks like a majority of our folks probably have added here. So, awesome. Hopefully you're taking a time, if you, if you worked on one, um, take a look at the other so you can sort of glean some new ideas, some other ideas as well. Is there anything that, um, Christy, that you would add? Do you think we've got a majority or? Yeah, I think we can uh, yeah. move on. Okay, awesome. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of your takeaways uh, from the activity, uh, but um, I'm going to actually stop sharing so that Christy can get more into the nuts and bolts of hypothesis and how you can use um, what you've learned today in a hypothesis. Yeah, so I just want to give a quick review of what it actually looks like to grade using hypothesis um, in a couple of different LMSs. So we talked about different approaches to grading today. We reviewed holistic, using holistic and analytic rubrics. So um, you can use those in your grading. Um, you can give the student the basic scoring guide, like with the single point rubric. And then I also did just want to point out here that if you don't want to use a rubric at all, you can always just give students a complete or incomplete grade or a pass fail. So actually in my class, because I really rely on social annotation as a way for students to engage and participate in the class. Um, I All of my annotations are graded as complete and complete. Like you either get the points or you don't get the points. And I give more specific targeted feedback to the student to kind of try and guide them in their future annotations. Um, so just some thoughts of how you could um, think about assigning grades to annotations um, depending on your own purposes. So most of the participants here are uh, using Canvas. So I'm going to go over both how to grade in Canvas and then how to grade in non-Canvas LMSs because Canvas uses its own system and then all of the other learning management systems that are not Canvas look the same. So in Canvas, Hypothesis actually works with SpeedGrader. So I'm just going to open up one of my um, Hypothesis assignments in uh, speed grader. Sorry, I thought I had this open already. I'm going to open my speed grader in Canvas, and you'll see that um, in speed grader, hypothesis will filter out the annotations by student. So I'm looking at Jennifer's annotations here, and I'm only seeing Jennifer's annotations in the grading um, sidebar. So I can just review what Jennifer has contributed, uh, and then I can give Jennifer that grade if I want to, and the um, comments, that private feedback, um, and move on to the next student. I want to highlight, and this will be the same no matter which learning management system that you're doing, that when Hypothesis um, filters by student, sometimes professors are like, okay, but I want to see like what they're 
replying to like if they're if they're replying to another student like we see with this example I'm looking at Malika's annotations and she's actually replying to Jennifer in one of these examples um you do have the option to expand and kind of show that context if you want to so while you're grading you can reveal more context or choose to um only look at you know the one student at a time so that's what we look like in Canvas. And this is uh, this slide is linked to our instructions for how to use SpeedGrader in Canvas. I'm not going to go through the steps here. I just want to note that you can also attach rubrics to your hypothesis enabled readings in Canvas. Um, there are just a specific order you have to do that in. If you're interested in doing that, um, I would make sure to review the instructions here or uh, review it with your customer success manager. Now, the other learning management systems, the grading looks a little bit different than Canvas. So I know we have some Blackboard users in here and a Moodle user. Um, I have this open in Blackboard, but it will actually look pretty much the same, whether we're in Blackboard, in Moodle, in Sakai, you know, whatever other learning management system. In this case, I have um, my annotation and text on the bottom of the screen, and I have my uh, grading bar at the top of the screen. Um, so I have this drop down here that shows me any student that has opened the document. So people get a little bit confused by this sometimes. Um, your student will show up in the drop down menu once they have opened the document, even if they haven't added an annotation yet. Um, but if they haven't actually gotten into the document, they won't show up here at all. So I have two students that have opened this document. I can filter to one of them. So I can see here again that if I look at Enrique's annotations and I'm, I'm looking at Enrique in the grading bar um, and it's filtering Enrique's um, annotations on the hypothesis sidebar here. Similar to what I looked at in Canvas, I can um, expand that context if I want to see who a student is replying to. After I review the annotations, I can enter the score in. Um, you know, into the grade bar at the top and submit the grade before I move on to the next student. And again, the annotations will be filtered. Um, so the arrangement of things is a little bit different than the Canvas speed grader, but we have pretty similar functionality going to look the same in Blackboard, Moodle, Sakai, our other learning management systems. One really important thing to note about the grade bar in these uh, Blackboard, Moodle, these other non-Canvas LMSs, is that no matter what, the grade bar is always going to say that your grade is out of 10. So in this instance, I actually set up my assignment to be out of 100 points, but the grade bar will still show out of 10 no matter what. So you just need to know that you can set up your assignment to be worth something else, um, so if I wanted my assignment to be worth five points, I could put that into the assignment settings when I set that up. When I put the grade in here out of 10, it will scale my grade back to the grade book. So if I wanted to give, um, you know, Jamie here an uh, eight out of 10, an 80%, that would scale back to a four out of five in the grade book, unless my brain has forgotten math and I'm doing that wrong um, at the end of the week, but it should scale back um, to your grades. So that is an important thing to kind of be aware of so that you're grading um, out of the correct amount. And you would say, it, just to add in there, as far as in the grade book is typically where you have an option to add comments. Like if not in the hypothesis grader, um, but for those other LMSs, is that true? Yes. So if you wanted to give private feedback to the students, you would go into the gradebook itself. And that'll probably look a little bit different depending on if you're in Moodle, uh, Brightspace, um, Blackboard, you know, whatever LMS you're doing, you, you can give private comments in the gradebook itself. Um, so this is what I had just noted about grading out of 10. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with just a couple of things that Suzanne will um, 
finish us up with. Yeah, thanks, Christy. Um, well, this is just mostly an uh, idea of what you have taken away from uh, both the, the feedback activity and then obviously some of the other things that we shared today. So uh, you do not have to answer on all of these three. You just pick uh, maybe one that was your biggest takeaway and add that most relevant question or thought in the chat. Um, we'd love to, to, to get your feedback. And hopefully you guys, uh, we have links to this, um, the slide deck. So, and, and obviously we also have links uh, to our knowledge base, uh, especially on several of the slides that uh, Christy shared. So if you really wanna dig in deeper um, on what the grading looks like in your LMS. Well, thank you. Is there, I think we've got some resource slides here for you, uh, which we always share. Um, We've got our uh, liquid margins. We've got a very hot topic one coming up. Um, I think there might be some links to registration on this slide about uh, chat GPT. Uh, I see it actually being a good complement to what we talked about today um, when we think about chat GPT and the implications. And again, it makes me come back to the idea that I love that hypothesis as a tool um, is much more focused on the process and not that end product. Um, so I think we might see more folks potentially um, leveraging hypothesis in their courses for that reason. Um, we have tons of great resources for social annotation assignment ideas. So definitely check that link out. We have a hypothesis educator forum, which I think a few of you guys might be in, um, but if you click that link, you get instructions to join that um, and really just have people to bounce ideas off of, get support from, and, and gather even more ideas than uh, what we have shared with you today. So really kind of crowdsourcing uh, your hypothesis support is awesome. And then, of course, we've got our technical support. If you ever need to re reach out um, with technical issues you might be having with the tool. Um, and then, I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit about Hypothesis Academy, Chrissy? I don't know, I'm putting her on the spot, but. <laughs> sure. Um, so we have a new um, kind of asynchronous online option if you want to learn more about hypothesis and uh, practice developing your own assignment. Um, we have a hypothesis certified educator credential, which is a two-week asynchronous course where you collaborate with faculty from across the country um, and work to see, uh, you know, what people's ideas for using social annotation are in their courses. Um, and our next cohort is launching March 14th. So there is a link on the slide um that you can where you can register uh, if your school is a hypothesis partner so if you have a subscription to hypothesis if you can use it in your courses then your um hypothesis academy registration is included in that there is not an extra cost i think the link should work bridget says she's having some issues with it's the the jam link or yeah, the i just clicked slide. and it worked but i don't i want to make sure um, and then our partner workshop links, you're in our partner workshop right now. If you're interested in joining a future one, um, they, they're they uh, available here. So you can check out upcoming dates and uh, register for those. Um, yeah, and I think if you have any questions, sorry, I just took, I just took over, Suzanne. No, <laughs> I, I, Christy, you Christy did, it was like the developer and or she led our first cohort. So I was like, I'm not going to attempt to talk better about <laughs> Hypothesis Academy than Christy since she's here. So thank you. Um, yeah. So I just want to say if anyone has any, I know some people are new to Hypothesis here. If you want any more support on like setting up hypothesis assignments, um, how to use it in your LMS, want to chat with someone about just like how to best use it in your course, email the address on the screen here and we'll get you connected with the best uh, customer success manager who works with your school. And um, yeah, that's, that's about, I think that's all we have for today. So okay. um, yeah, if we have any other questions, um, Bridget, I was actually clicking on the link from the chat. So I wouldn't try clicking on the link on the, on the Zoom screen, I was clicking on the, the link from the Zoom chat itself. 
and that was working for me. Um, but I will be sending out the slides via email as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll get that recording too. So yes. lots of resources and lots of ways to follow up. Thank you guys so much. Uh, obviously have a wonderful and warm weekend as much as you can. Uh, we appreciate you. Thanks everyone.